So I think we can, in fact, replace the God concept, that is, the God as the explanation of all things natural, and I think, in fact, we've already done it. It's just a matter of developing a socially appealing way to get the word out to everybody. Which brings me uh, to religion and whether or not anything having to do with scientific inquiry, whether it's the practice of science or the fruits of it, could ever offer the social embrace that religious organizations do. And I was intrigued, actually, very intrigued. I think this is the only thing I agreed with in the comments of Steven Weinberg, that um, <clears throat> I was intrigued to hear him say that he knows people who belong to religions, and when he talks to them one-on-one, -on -one, they, they, you know, they're not so sure. Um, you know, that there are people who maybe didn't really believe everything, but they were part of religions anyway. They, you know, they were group members. And that, I've, I found that, you know, interesting because it underscores my suspicion that I think a lot of people who belong to religions, I'm not so sure they're completely hard over 100% certain that there's a God. You know, maybe they fill out these, these polls and they say, yes, I believe in God. Maybe, you know, that's what they feel they have to do. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if they're really not so certain. But they are attracted to religions. We are social animals. We love to belong to groups. And so... I think the reasons for religion are primary, primarily social and that many of them may be on the fence about God and other teachings. I mean, just take Catholics and John Paul II. People loved John Paul II. I actually loved John Paul II. How could you not love such a lovable old man? But most, I mean, a lot of Catholics did not buy what he had to say about the use of contraceptives. So they took some of it, they rejected the others. The desire to belong to religion and religious groups is, is a paramount drive here that I think we can address. And here I offer a possibly crazy idea, maybe it's a dangerous idea, that to bring the findings of science and the astonishing story of the universe that science has, has to tell, to bring that to everyone, we should let the success of the religious formula guide us. And we could debate this endlessly and there's lots of things that we could talk about adopting that religions do and do well. But I'll just mention a few. Uh, we could replace the social organizations of religion with something else. Someone said, but religions do so many good things. There was a billion dollars gathered by religious organizations and delivered to the Katrina victims. And that is, that's a phenomenally wonderful thing. It's a desire in humans we want to encourage. I don't see why the organizations that do that have to be based on religion. We can develop other organizations that do that. Uh, but have the same kind of bond, give people the same kind of thing that uh, religion gives them. Let's teach our children from a very young age about the story of the universe and its incredible richness and beauty. It is already so much more glorious and awesome and even comforting than anything offered by any scripture, a God concept that I know of. And I, I think a large part of the discussions and the debates that we're having is that it's true, we can't, we're not going to convert the adults. People very rarely change their minds, so it's kind of hopeless to be talking about taking all the Islamic fundamentalists today and trying to convert them. It's, it's not going to happen. I agree with someone, whoever said that, it's probably not going to happen. But we can teach the younger generation. There's hope for the younger generation. Someone used the term gradual illuminations of the mind, and I think that's the key, the operative phrase here. And then finally, we could celebrate. Okay, we have a great many reasons for jubilation. That we actually can know what we know is so empowering and uplifting, at least to me as a scientist, I get off on that all the time. How we can actually know the things that we know is just a beautiful thing and it's worth celebrating. How about instituting a national holiday to honor all the knowledge that humankind has created, has, has, has accumulated over the last how many years about the, the universe and evolution and so on. How about a holiday called the Day of Great Awakening. You know, let's put it on the ballot. Uh, and we've already had in our brief history, we've already had many moments that deserved such recognition and celebration, and I'm just going to remind you of a few of them. This, as you know, was the first time we ever saw Earth as a whole planet from space. It was taken on December 29th, 1968, by the astronauts orbiting the moon from Apollo 8. It had an enormous impact on our view of our place in, our, in, this, in the cosmos and our planetary home. It certainly was a moment that I think deserved celebration. And then of course there's the famous pale blue dot. This was the picture taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft when it was far above the plane of the solar system. 
and out beyond the orbit of Neptune. I'm very proud to say I played a part in the effort, which was led, in fact, by Carl Sagan in taking this picture, the significance of which Carl wrote so eloquently about in his book, The Pale Blue Dot. And now I'm also tremendously proud to say that Cassini, the spacecraft that I'm associated with, and our cameras in particular, have made their own contribution to this collection of celestial views of our home planet. On September 15th, Cassini's trajectory took it far from the planet, far from Saturn, and deep into the shadow, uh, the planet's shadow, and from there, shielded from direct sunlight, we were able to take, we were able to point our cameras back in the direction of the sun, which is something we really can't do when it's not, when the sun is not shielded, when, when the spacecraft is not uh, protected from, the, from direct sunlight. We were able to look in the direction of the sun and take a um, series of images uh, of the entire inner Saturnian system and these images have been mosaic together to produce a view that no human has ever seen before. This was a total eclipse of the sun seen from the other side of Saturn. And here you see the planet, you see its main rings which are illuminated by from below, from light scattered within the rings. Uh, we see the largest ring itself, this is the E-ring. In fact, this ring is the result of the exhalations of Enceladus of these fine icy particles that are emerging from the interior of Enceladus and orbiting the planet. And it is a wild thought indeed, I tell you, to think that if there are microbes on Enceladus, they are, be they are being shot out of the moon, frozen in these tiny particles, and they're orbiting Saturn in this ring. We don't know if that's the case, but like I said, it's a wild thought. And as if this spectacle wasn't, or weren't dazzling enough, we can spot from across a billion miles of interplanetary space our own planet Earth nestled in the arms of Saturn's rings, right there. And so um, I think it will probably be a long time before we see anything this moving again. But I believe that coming from uh, where I come from, maybe it's not hard to imagine I believe this way, but I don't think anything has greater power to alter and correct our perception of ourselves and our place in the cosmos than the sight of our own a uh, small little world from across the depths of space. In the end, this ever-widening view of Earth against the immensity of space is perhaps the greatest legacy of all our interplanetary travels and of all our scientific inquiry. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah.